I, I would be discussing the, uh, the role of the military because it is the main perpetrator, uh, despite the fact that there are non-state actors who have um, in many forms and, um, you know, collaborated with the military in the persecution of both uh, communities or groups. Uh, but although my uh, comments are going to be on the military's role and they're not going to be uh, restricted or confined to just the two groups because the, 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 the military's uh, persecution extends well beyond these two uh, <coughs> ethnic and religious communities. In two quotes, um, the military's attitude uh, towards particularly Kachin and Rohingya uh, can be summarized. When President Thane Sein, at the time, uh, this was back in 2012 when he was nominated uh, for Nobel Peace Prize, uh, he first made his appearance at the United Nations General Assembly and there were a couple of uh, you know, in-service generals with him in New York. A friend of mine was in the room, and uh, uh, he was not one of the generals, but you know, ex-military officer. And he described to me the conversation that they had. And the, on the Kachin, the Burmese general's view is that you, you need to understand the tropics <laughs> to, to understand this metaphor. The Kachin resistance is a mosquito in the mosquito net. They can be eliminated at any time that is strategically convenient to the military. Of course, like, you know, statistically speaking, the positional war cannot be fought by the Kachin and retain their resistance positions. That has been, you know, uh, the case uh, with, uh, you know, uh, the Kachin losing different strategic um, positions. So this is how the military view one of the founding ethnic communities of Burma, a mosquito in the net, yeah? And that is shared widely among the top brass. With respect to Rohingya, the Rohingyas are considered um, or have been framed uh, since 1978 as a threat to, existential threat to national security both culturally and demographically, because of the 17 or 16 different Muslim communities that are scattered across the country, only the Rohingya are immediately adjacent to one of the most populous Muslim countries named Bangladesh. And, and that is also the country where they have cultural and historical ties. And in fact, it is not just the Rohingyas that have ties with Bangladesh. Rakhine Buddhists themselves have ties with that um, country in the pre-nation state uh, uh, period. So when you, so the difference between the military's attitudes towards the Kachin and the Rohingya, the Burmese do not have intention to eliminate the Kachins. The Burmese want to, in quotes, pacify uh, in the old colonial language and subjugate and, and make the Kachins take the slots that the Burmese military deem suitable for them. Yeah. In contrast, with respect to the Rohingya, because it is deemed completely as a threat to national security, they are there for elimination. Although the Holocaust style, you know, final solution is no longer conceivable. That is why I, it's straight from the mouth of an ex brigadier general, a close friend of mine, who was posted in Rakhine State, described to me face to face. It's like, you know, white racists. When white racists meet, um, you know, or like a they assume that the other person shares that racist ideology. So because I'm Burman and Buddhist, so this brigadier general calls me little brother and said, you know what, there are too many, we can't kill them all. They are too many, we cannot kill them all. So they devised various strategies, yeah, 
to destroy the Rohingya from the foundations of life. And so um, I won't go into the, uh, the genocidal language and all that. So these two imageries sum up how the Burmese military approach this issue. And in one issue, or one typical issue that often comes up when people discuss, scholars, journalists, whoever, Burmese military is opaqueness, secrecy, secret, you know, secretive nature of this organization. But for someone like myself, I'll go into it uh, just for 30 seconds, who, whose families over three generations have served in this institution, the military is legible, very legible. Yeah? And uh, the, because they are legible, I have been screaming foul because I know what is next, what is their next move. You know, including the, uh, the narrative of democratization. You know, I was a fool five years ago saying, this is sham. This is not what it appears to be. This is not Mandela moment for the Burmese. And, but that was the dominant discourse. Uh, how do I know this institution and, and its strategies that may not be op uh, transparent to the uh, other eyes. I was myself um, admitted to military officer training school at the age of 16. Were it not for my father, I would, <laughs> I would be with this uh, murderous regime. And my contemporaries are in the, uh, essentially waiting in the wings to take over the reins of the military, not government, the military. Government is not important. It is the military that is in the driver's seat. It will remain so until there are radical events, you know, uh, change the power equation. And then secondly, I operate in uh, these like twilight areas. I am neither Burmese nor minorities, you know, or ethnic nationality, because my uncles, on, on both sides of my parents taught me how to handle firearm theoretically at home when they're at, at home coming from you know the in quotes front lines that means like battlefields and you know uh, war zones where the army was supposedly fighting a just and defensive war but we never asked as Burmese public why are the Burmese military in the regions that are ancestrally belonging to other communities. We look at them as peripheral buffer zones. See, this takes us to um, what Mandy was saying earlier, um, militarism. Yeah. War is the best soil where militarism thrives. It is the best fertilizer. Conflicts and wars. Generals love nothing more than conflicts within society, conflicts within communities, ethnic or religious or class. And they prey on these conflicts. That is why, you know, upon independence in 1948, we had only two major ethnic resistance or revolt. The very day the Burma celebrated independence, and Union Jack coming down on the 4th of January, 1948, in the wee hours, Burma army was fighting in Rakhine State. And that relates to Rohingya. Burma army was confronted with what they consider two distinct enemies. One from the then separatist Mujahideens, who wanted to be with then East Pakistan, not with the predominantly Buddhist Burma. And then you've got Rakhine nationalists who felt they had been shortchanged by the Burmese nationalists because the British made a deal with the Burmese Buddhist nationalists, left out Mon Buddhist 
and Rakhine Buddhist nationalist. That was when that, that transfer of independence once again disrupted the equilibrium of ethnic relations that had begun to crystallize over 120 years of British colonial rule. And, and, and the, the second point is, we say the Second World War never ended in Burma, literally. Within 90 days of independence, Burma's in, Burma was thrusted back into the war. And literally, with the leftover weapons, stockpiles, you know, left over by the surrender Japanese troops, allied forces of British and Americans. Yeah? So we have not been out of war, out of Second World War. It never ended. The world may be moving into the Third World War. For us, it's just transition to the next big war. Yeah? And uh, finally, what are the strategies that the Burmese military uses? Well, I think they inherited racist and racialized colonial state. You know, colonialism was not just simply economic exploitation. It was a, a, a you know, typical apartheid racist state and structure. And, you know, oil in Burmese days had this expression. British Empire was essentially run by administ civilian administrators with the protection or behind the protection of one million bayonets. And there was an expression that he, you know, he used, and that is precisely the nature of the Burmese state. It is a military, with the exception of about 10 years in the um, you know, transition period from British colonial rule to nationalist Burman control civilian democratic parliamentary era. The last 50 plus year, the Burmese military has reshaped and rewrote history, reshaped social, class, and ethnic relations that would support their racialized, racist ideology. When you have finally militarist regime, institutionalized militarism as the ruling ideology, they are the ones who reap the benefit of control over population, control over land, control over resources. The border regions of Burma, where non-Burmese ethnic communities are ancestrally scattered, you know, with uh, very fluid ethnic identities, mixed identities, the Burmese military came up with the blood-based, purified notion of ethnic identity. So our history that is completely reworked radically by the Burmese military reads ethnicity and races into the past. And, uh, that, that, and then finally, that is racialized, militarized, economically predatory military state, you know, that is at the root of today's conflicts. And I do not see how problems can be addressed without confronting this elephant in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic.